Um, my father is a chef and so I started cooking from a young age in New Zealand. Um, he's an MOGB, so a uh, Mayor Ouvrier de Grand Breton. Um, and as soon as I could, I left New Zealand when I was 17, moved to London, dreams of working for Gordon Ramsay and all of that. I um, worked in a bunch of Franglish restaurants um, and then worked my way through um, Paris, um, Spain, um, and then moved to Australia and then wound up working on a tiny island at the bottom of the world. I used to work at a restaurant uh, called Key in Sydney for a long time and um, most of our produce, like super high-end place, most of our produce came from Tasmania. And because um, I'm not from Australia originally, you know, like we'd get these abalone come in from Tasmania, like potatoes, seaweed, crayfish, so many things. Like I'd say a third of what we use came from there. And so I just kind of imagined it as like this like crazy wonderful island full of like amazing produce. Very like seafood and vegetable based. I would say, because there's a lot of um, local fishermen that go out. We buy directly from the fishermen. There's no fish market. Uh, there's not really a fishmonger. Um, and we buy direct from individual farmers. We don't have a vegetable provador that just like buys off them and delivers. There's no middlemen. I dive for a lot of seaweed and abalone, which is like easily available there. Um, two types of sea urchin, the long spine and short spine. Um, wallaby uh, gets hunted on the islands around and also on Tasmania itself. Um, I use a lot of that in the restaurant. And there's a lot of people like um, growing things like skerrit and mangelwurzel and like, like interesting more kind of old school vegetables that maybe aren't commonly grown these days. If Franklin was a bunch of flavours, it would probably be lovage, abalone, wakame, um, roasted mussel butter. Yeah, those are the main ones. Oh, advice for culinary students. Um, I would say learn as much as you can. Do things that put you outside your comfort zone. Um, Force yourself to learn things that you don't know, like assess like what your knowledge is, where your weak spots are, and then improve on those things and force yourself to, because it's very easy to just stay within your comfort zone and go, okay, like I'm good at like cutting fish or pastry or whatever it is. And then just like focus on that and do that as opposed to like forcing yourself to do the things that maybe you don't enjoy as much. When I was a younger chef, I was always uh, somewhat of a stalker of Michelle Bras. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would write him a letter every year in very bad French asking to work in this restaurant. It took about 12 years and then he said yes. Um, and I suppose when I was younger, before I worked there, I would look at his books and get inspiration from them and, you know, wonder about like, you know, how they were so focused on vegetables and like their techniques and things like that. And then working there, um, I just completely changed the way that I see food and the way that I saw cooking. Prior to that, I kind of thought that, you know, like all of these hipster tattooed foragers, you know, were kind of just doing it because it was trendy and things like that. But then living and working in a place where, like, if you can pick it outside, then it goes on the menu. And if it's not growing in nature, you just don't use it. Um, they really like put their money where their mouth is. And like, it's just like, that's the way that they live. And that's the way the restaurant is. Um, you only buy vegetables off people that you know, or you grow them in the garden, or you pick what's in the wild, and that's what's available to you. There's no like things coming in in like little plastic punnets just because you've ordered pansies. It's not the way it works. Um, and to be able to work at quite a high level, but be heavily changeable depending on what's in the garden, which I feel like a lot of restaurants get stuck into you know, everything being like super, super consistent. And so you lose the ability to change and adapt. They taught me to forage. They taught me to identify um, like hundreds of different wild herbs um, and to go out in nature and just find them and know the areas where they would grow. Um, and then in terms of cooking vegetables, um, well, I was on the gargoyu section, so. Um, they all get cooked in so many different ways. Like, you know, um, would make like vaduvan the spice mix and then like make it really wet and then bury carrots in it and like roast them inside that. And then like black radishes would make like a caramel and then let it out and um, cook them sous vide, like in a, you know, basically like a really bitter, like let out caramel. Like there were so many different ways of cooking vegetables there that um, I came across as opposed to normally, you know, people throw them in the oven or blanch them and that's kind of it. I grew up as a vegetarian, so for me, I don't know, cooking vegetables was kind of normal and natural. I just, 
I treat them the same way that I would treat meat or fish, essentially. It's like, okay, you have a vegetable, how are we going to cook it? Test out a couple of different ways, see which way is best for it, and then think about which flavors work with it. Like, so, you know, it's the star of the show. The same way that you would if you had a piece of fish, you'd be like, should we steam it? Should we grill it? Like, what should we do? It's exactly the same. Pretty much any vegetable in the wood-fired oven, that's, that's a given. Also, um, I really enjoy cooking vegetables over charcoal. Um, which other ways? Uh, I still, I cook saltus the same way that they do at Bras. I, you know, some things like they need a blanch first. Um, so saltus, I blanch and then um, like pan fry in butter, like sort of the old fashioned way, like you'd cook a sweet bread or something. Um, palm hearts, I really enjoy cooking. I normally roast them in the husk, split them down the center and then char grill just the face side um, over charcoal. Uh, those are probably some of my favorite ones. I used to travel a lot to um, like to broaden my knowledge um, and like eat constantly in other people's restaurants to see things. But then at the moment, I mean, I live on a tiny island and I live 45 minutes outside of town in a place with no internet and no television. Um, so everything I do now is pretty much based upon what's around me. It's like I can walk into the ocean and collect seaweed and get abalone and sea urchins and so like it's very limited in terms of what produce is available but I find that drives you to do more and different things with what you have and think about okay it's sea lettuce it tastes like shit fresh what else can we do with it <laughs> what, are, what are the other ways to prepare it like how can we push this further with my staff at work I mean, every time I put a dish on, I talk to them about it. Often these days now I've been able to relinquish things a little bit. I like talk to them about the idea first and then get them to make the prep for it so that they have input into it. And then we come together and like stick it on a plate together and then work through, um, you know, if it needs to be like more acidic or, you know, cooked more or less or X, Y, Z. We take a lot of field trips. I mean, I visit at least minimum one supplier every week. Um, so often, what have we done so far? We went to um, a guy who brews beer for us recently and took the whole team. And then uh, we're going to like an oyster farmer soon. Um, but I mean, we're basically in the countryside, so it's, it's easy to be able to do those things. A lot of our suppliers are within 30 minutes of the restaurant. So it's easier to be able to take the team to do that. Also, um, for a long time in winter, I generally make cheese at the restaurant on a day that we're closed on Mondays, and it's kind of just like an open thing. Anyone who wants to come can. Uh, because the industry is very fast paced and moderately stressful, um, it's probably why I live in the middle of nowhere opposite Bruny Island with no internet and no TV. It means that at home I can't be stressed, it's impossible. I make sure that I have one day per week where I don't go into the restaurant and I try not to think about the restaurant for one day. I suppose a lot of chefs feel this way, but I'm always super excited to visit Japan. I feel like Japan was one of the first places in a long time where I had things that, where I ate things that, that blew my mind, that I didn't know what they were, I didn't know how to prepare them, I had no idea. Um, whereas normally in Western restaurants, you know, you have a fair idea of like what it is that you're eating. Um, uh, yeah, I love Japan. I love the knives, the aesthetic, everything. I've done a lot of, you know, like military gastronomy in its time and all of those things. And now personally, I just enjoy like making cheese, making charcuterie, making bread, just going back to basics and making everything from scratch yourself. Um, and I feel like that's been going on for a while. Also like restaurants are super wasteful. We need to start eliminating waste and like looking at what it is that we do and how it affects the environment.